Dungeon Moderator for Cardinal Film Fights. Before I say anything else, if you came here for a certain fight, click in the description below. Today we're welcoming Catherine, Wes, and Pat, all professors, all faculty members, and it's okay, they told me I could call them that, so I, I'm jumping on that, I'm jumping on that opportunity there. So, as always, we have our fact checker, Von Storm, and our timekeeper and scorekeeper, Paige, over there. So, the way this works is that there are four questions that you have been shown and have created answers for. I'm going to put them in a random order, and I'm going to make really horrible segues. They are terrible segues, like from question to question. That's a little, that's a little modus operandi thing of mine. Um, so we start each round with a 60-second intro where you introduce your choice, why you picked it, just kind of setting it up. And then we go straight into a five-minute forum where you take, take each other down, build up your own arguments, and then we follow that with a 30-second conclusion where you all wrap it up. Now, the way this is scored, in, uh, the first, first place gets three points, second place gets two points, and third place gets one point. In the final question, the points are doubled so everyone can stay alive up until the very end. So without further ado, we'll start with the first question. So the first question as you, as you could tell from my David Hyde Pierce and my Hello Dolly reference, I'm, I'm kind of a musical person. I'm a theater education major, so I enjoy the theater. So I really enjoy song and dance numbers in classic movie musicals. So we're going to start, uh, start with Catherine. Oh, good having yeah, just introduce your song and dance, and we'll go from there. So, hi. Thank you. You're is my time going? Yes, my time is going. So I chose the staircase dance from the Little Colonel mainly because when I was going through and just sort of looking things up, that one came back to me immediately when I, when I was a little kid watching a bunch of Shirley Temple films. The thing that I thought was interesting about it and why I think it's one of the best is it was the first interracial dance number ever on film. Mm -hmm. um, it was banned in the South because of that. Um, and it actually became bigger than the movie itself, where the, the, it's such an iconic song and dance sort of number. We have uh, uh, Bill uh, Bojangles Robinson and Shirley Temple kind of dancing on the stairs, and he's singing a little bit of a cappella. Um, and it became more famous than the film in and of itself because the, the song and dance number itself was so strong. Um, and also I think it's, you know, arguably Bojangles should have been an even bigger star. He was pretty darn big anyway. Um, and so it, it sort of manages to immortalize um, somebody who could have been forgotten by history because of the racist Hollywood practices of the time and now. Awesome, awesome. We'll just go straight down the line. So Wes, if you Okay, want. Um, I picked Singing in the Rain because um, it's Singing in the Rain, the movie is picked as the, the greatest uh, musical ever made and, and they're just hand in hand with each other. Um, I also picked it because um, it's one that is not only synonymous with that movie, but it it stays contemporary with uh, something like uh, um, Clockwork Orange, where it's used at counter purposes. In a, in a dark comedy, you want the exact opposite, you know, musically on the soundtrack. And so it works very nicely along those particular lines. It's also um, been picked at by AFI as like the third best uh, song uh, of all time. And uh, as a daughter, uh, as, a, as a father with two daughters um, who are both in dance forever, um, and I need money, so <laughs> you send in money for uh, the, the cost. Um, it was the most covered thing in about 15 or 20 years of um, dance numbers for, for with my daughters when I would go to their recitals. Awesome, and we'll finish off with Pat. It's really hard to argue against singing in the rain, but I'm gonna, go, I'm gonna do so anyway. Um, I'm actually arguing for Good Morning, the Good Morning song and dance uh, bit from the same film. And one of the reasons why I would argue for that is that I think it actually fits better with the ethos of the movie. Because the movie is all about collaboration and teamwork. Um, singing in the Rain is a great, uh, this, the Singing in the Rain number is a great performance of an in, by an individual dancer. And it's, it's, about, it's about Don Lockwood in that moment. But the movie really celebrates the team of Don, Kathy, and Cosmo. And Good Morning is their number together. So I think it fits in better with the movie. The movie really kind of destroys the star system. And it, dis it, ta it takes stars down a peg because the villain is Lena Lamont, the great mm. star, right? But, and, and she's vanquished by this team of collaborators. So I'm going with Good Morning, where three dancers cover three rooms in three minutes. Very interesting. All right, we'll go straight into our five-minute forum. So have at each other's throats. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
Well, since I connect Singing in the Rain, the song, so much with the movie, um, the movie I love because it's it's also a historical movie about becoming a sound in movies. And so it gets used in my classes a whole lot. So it's kind of like a multi-purpose, uh, you know, dark comedy, the song we used in. It gets, it's connected with a historical transition in the sound era. And it's, it's also, uh, when something is so popular, it gets spoofed a whole lot. So, I mean, it's been spoofed everywhere. I, when I saw Spam a lot, I was surprised that it was spoofed in that. So... Uh, it just covers a lot of ground to me. I mean, it is iconic. There's no question about that. It's, I mean, this is the one where they use the milk, like the watered down milk to make the rain, right? right. Imagine what that set must have smelled like at oh, the end I know, of that, I uh, know. taping. You had to yeah. dance in it. <laughs> right. But as iconic, the same thing is the best. Right, that's the mm -hmm. question. So it's the that's fact true. that something mm -hmm. is spoofable or the fact that something is recognizable automatically means it's the best because something can also be, so there, things can be spoofed or parodied for lots and lots of reasons. Yeah. Well, it's interesting when you when you look at, uh, like, what's the best Western, what's the best film noir, what's the best personality comedy, you can always have a really pretty good debate and uh, invariably Singing in the Rain comes out number one. Now, actually, my favorite one is All That Jazz. I, I'm sort of a post-happy uh, post go lucky musical I like the darker musicals of the Fosse era but um, um, that one seems to be for most people no question that's that's the best um, musical and so you connect that with a song to me but um, so what do you do with the fact that since you're both coming from the same musical I've been told before that we're supposed to go at each other oh, I'm gonna yes. try come I'm gonna try really come hard at yeah. come <laughs> at you. you got yeah um, you can't handle my, the my truth. <laughs> <laughs> rank makes me a little bit nervous <laughs> right now um, but no, I mean, looking at the fact that those are both from the same film, how do you actually pick one from the same? Because the entire film is iconic. Um, so one of the things that I think is interesting about the scene from Little Colonel is that uh, NPR, when they're kind of going through and looking at their greatest films, they said this is one of the most iconic scenes in American movie history. Not even just musicals, but movie history across the board. Um, that this song and dance number, when we look at what's the best, I mean, something that manages to be iconic, not only among on, um, in its own film, um, but in film uh, musicals, otherwise, but just the, the whole history of film that manages to be iconic out, out of it um, and become something that surpasses all of it. Whereas you have the full body of work that you're both kind of pulling from. How do you choose between those two um, when the entire film is a known musical? Well, uh, I love the scene, so this isn't, com isn't coming from me, but there's a um, certain segment of the population that, that finds it very politically incorrect. and. Uh, um, derogatory uh, towards Bojangles, uh, mm -hmm. you know, because uh, I think Gene Kelly said that, you know, him and Fred Astaire would have been nothing without, you know, this great black dancer, and his greatest numbers was this little, you know, three-year-old, I don't know six. how old. She six, was six, six at the time. Uh, yeah, uh, absolutely. So there's, there's a little bit of, um, uh, that's a little edge there that it's no, that's absolutely true. They, so he absolutely in that role um, is kind of cast as this very, very racist caricature of sort of this yeah, clueless, yeah. clueless slave and that kind of thing, um, which I think is absolutely something that is indicative of the time that they weren't above their above the time at all. It, it, yeah. It's rife in movies back in that era. Um, what I think is interesting is that Bo, uh, Bojangles was such a talent. Um, that it managed to record something even in its incredibly flawed way. It managed to save this talent yeah. that, frankly, is surrounded by ignorance. If you watch the film, I mean, you can really tell that so it, it was all very condescending. In other words, it's better than Fred Astaire in blackface in, in uh, is it Top Hat? Or yeah, that... Yeah, it's, better, it's than better than anybody in blackface. I would yeah. think. Yes, <laughs> right, yeah. right. but the fact that you know, it, absolutely, we have this sort of racist industry that you're seeing across the board, and so the, and there's not enough of him in the movie, and he certainly wasn't given his due. But there's this bit of brilliance that was able to be recorded, um, yeah. and uh, Shirley Temple was, you know, iconic in her own her own way, and so they're both. It's kind of a little bit of lightning in the bottle with these two, be managing to be there together, and she did learn to tap dance with him, and they, he actually yeah. trained her, and yeah. they ran around together. Um, so what you're kind of seeing there, that camaraderie was real between no. the two of them. Um, and it was, like I said, the first time you ever had an interracial dance number ever on film. But the yeah. question isn't what's the most iconic, it's what's the best, right? I mean, I don't yeah. know that there's a lot. It's also one heck of a dance, Pat. I Have don't you know seen it? The dancing up know. the stairs? Oh, is it's incredible. Is Shirley Temple a good dancer? And, you know, the, does, the a, camera, does a camera move around at all? It seems to me that it's a pretty static. It's static, but know. I think it shows the simplicity of the skill of dancing. See, you I want to. I want to. I want to argue the for thing. the ma magician's faint of of uh, uh, Good Morning, where it takes your attention off of Debbie Reynolds' feet, so that you can't tell that she's moving her feet about one third as much as the two guys. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I love. I love the a lot of the numbers in the in the 
<laughs> oh, 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 that's oh, a good shot. <laughs> so for the 30 second conclusions, we'll just head back the other way. So we'll start with you, Pat. Okay, well, I'm go I'm, I'll add one more point, which is that I really like the eclecticism of the dancing in the good morning scene. There's a little flamenco bit. There's a little uh, Hawaiian bit. And I think that the movie is such an eclectic thing. It's a gathering up of all these different genres, right? They walk through the, st the studio set and all these different movie genres are playing in the end. And I think in, in the end, mm -hmm. that movie is, a, is, a, uh, is praising eclecticism and the, yeah, yeah. eclecticism. And, and period. <laughs> <laughs> Buzzword of the day. <laughs> Oh, another, uh, I always tell my students that when you watch a movie, it's uh, after the movie, you should find a signature scene that just everything boils down to that scene. And for me, the Singing in the Rain number in Singing in the Rain, um, it's a Gene Kelly film. It's a Gene Kelly production. Uh, he was e egomaniac, really. But anyway, um, uh, to me, it's the whole movie in a nutshell. And he saved his career by figuring this out, that he can make a sound movie now. So. <laughs> And we'll finish off with Kathy. Yes, finish off with me. Um, so speaking of that signature scene, I think obviously that's the case with the little colonel. Um, and the thing that I love about it is that it is the purity of the dance. It's the purity of the, the, the vocal performance of Bilbo Dangles at the time. Um, and that it is something where there's not a lot of pomp to it. It's just two people in a staircase. And I remember as a child being mesmerized. And that says something a lot about a performance that a kid watching a black and white film of just two people on the stairs, and I've never forgotten it. Hmm. Interesting, interesting. All right. Any facts to check, Vaughn? Everything checked out. Awesome, awesome. Anyone in the background have any thoughts that they would like to share? No. <laughs> You're all scared, aren't you? Because they're, they're faculty thought, members. They're thoughtless. Yeah. <laughs> so You've got no thoughts. No thoughts. They are, yeah, they are thoughts. That's why I'm here and the one making decisions. No, <laughs> not really. <laughs> no, my thoughts, I'm just the one who's willing to say what they're thinking. Okay. So... <laughs> I so make that. Nervous. Is that a question? <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, no, no. That's that, that, that's so you know. Marlon I'm Brando. Thinking. That yeah, was yeah. I, I make that noise so you know I'm thinking about oh. it. No. This is your equivalent of the Jeopardy theme. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> I would expect it would have buzz. You know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I didn't think I was actually going to do this for for this thing, but I'm going to give first place to Catherine. Second place to Pat, and third place to Wes. Mm. I'm sorry. And so I, get a I car or anything? Is there something yeah, behind the, a, yeah. you know, but wait, the wall of turtle wax? More. Congratulations, <laughs> you want a trip to Puerto Rico. It's nice. Actually, that wouldn't be so nice right now. Sorry, Puerto Rico. <laughs> you might want to stop, stop now. Yeah, so, sorry, bats. Puerto Rico. Like bats. Yeah. <laughs> Back to bats. No. So I'll provide my reasoning, though. Um. I think you made a strong case that the dance was so impactful that it, it stood out from the film itself, despite its racist overtones. Uh, the dance itself has survived as an important artifact, and that it, in, its, in its simplicity that it is a beautiful dance and an important dance artifact that has survived today. I'm going to give second place to you, Pat, because I think you made a great case that um, the good morning number does tie the whole theme of the dance together. And it's just, it's great skill that you're able, that they were able to misdirect you from Debbie Reynolds' feet into, <laughs> into the whole ensemble number, which is, it's a lovely tap dance film, and it does provide the, I think, the overall theme of Singing in the Rain. And Singing in the Rain itself is probably by far the most iconic number of Singing in the Rain. It, and probably one of the most iconic scenes of all movie musicals, but I'm not sure it is the best display of skill in in a dance and and song, even though it is the most iconic. And so that is why I'm going to give first place to Catherine, second place to Pat, and third place to Wes on this. Can we do a thing where we can tally up how many times we all say iconic tonight? Oh yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's iconic, like the just Cardinal like Film Fights ding, drinking ding. game, which we don't <laughs> condone or anything. No, but like every well, time we got water. <laughs> yeah, take a yeah. Well, I'll be well every hydrated. Every one of us says, "Well, it's iconic." <laughs> yeah, it's iconic. <laughs> okay, so as you can see, you know, waiting for the scores adds a layer of suspense. So I barely withstood it. I, 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 exactly. I almost went down. So speaking of suspense, let's talk about the master of suspense, Alfred Hitchcock. You see, that's the type of horrible segue I'm talking about. So 
We're going to go next to the best Alfred Hitchcock film, and this time we'll start with Wes, go to Pat, and finish with Catherine. Okay, I chose North by Northwest, and my decision was I wasn't going with maybe the greatest um, uh, Hitchcock, the greatest film that Hitchcock made. I was going for the greatest Hitchcock movie, and North by Northwest, hands down, uh, has more of the I had I almost said iconic, has more <laughs> of the basic components of any other um, uh, Hitchcock film. And I'm I'm doing a book now on comedy in Hitchcock, and I've I, I've gone through a lot of the British films that I I wasn't as on top of as before. And uh, when you go through everything that he's done, uh, he's known as horror. He's uh, he's known as you know uh, the thriller kind of thing. But he's really it's more or less defined as comic thriller. And uh, nobody does it better than uh, North by Northwest. Um, and it has just every element that you can come up with in his films. Uh, I haven't even gone through my list here, and I'm going down the uh, uh, the four seconds, two seconds. Okay. Next is Pat. Well, I'm going with everybody's favorite Hitchcock movie, Vertigo. And I say that with some humor because Vertigo <laughs> is a deeply unpleasant movie. <laughs> um, uh, just for the record, uh, the Sight and Sound poll in 2012 uh, from the British Film Institute displaced K Citizen Kane and named Vertigo as the greatest film ever made. So it is, in fact, the greatest film ever made. Um, it's, in my view, the weirdest movie ever to come out of the Hollywood studio system from a major director. This is a movie where Mr. Likeability, Jimmy Stewart, has a nervous breakdown, um, manipulates a woman into dressing exactly the way he wants, turns her into, turns her into his ideal, um, you know, has this sort of like, you know, weird animation crack up. Um, I would uh, I would argue with Wes that actually Vertigo is the most Hitchcocky of all the Hitchcock films in that Hitchcock is always wanting to make you uncomfortable about the pleasure you take in looking. And no, no movie does that more than Vertigo. And we'll finish with Catherine. All right, I chose Psycho because having studied a lot of Hitchcock in grad school, uh, Psycho was just the one I liked the best. And I don't really have a better reason than that. No, um, <laughs> I, I think it's, I, I do think it's a brilliant film. I think it holds up. I think it's something where it's almost impossible to, they've tried to remake it. I think it's impossible to do it because of all the elements that kind of came together. One of the things, I also think it's one of the riskiest of things that uh, narratively um, that Hitchcock did because we do have a story where a protagonist is taken away in the middle of the story. I mean, that's, that's a risky thing to do and all it leaves you with is this weird guy that you don't really want to root for, right? And so it creates this really weird feeling. Um, uh, it's incredibly infamous and it actually sort of launched the psychological thriller genre in and of itself. And so it became something that founded other things. You know, it, it, um, it became um, something that created a new genre. Um, and it was, uh, it sort of validated horror as a potential for art. Interesting, interesting. For the record, my personal favorite is Rope, but that's just me. I actually, Rope was, yeah. Oh. I, love, well, I love Rope because I it's, uh, yeah. It, yeah. I love the single location and that, that it's based yeah. on uh, Leopold and Loeb and yeah, this is good. And the whole um, have a challenge to do with the moving, moving everything, yeah. single mm -hmm. takes and things mm -hmm. like that. that was but anywho, but these are all great choices as well. I'm judging you on those choices, not the fact that you didn't pick so the we right. So basically one. saying, no. if any of us had chosen, we, chosen right. we all came in third place. Is yeah, that's saying? you know, yeah, we're getting this <laughs> round done really <laughs> quick. No, we'll go straight into our five minute forum. Well, let me um, let me go for Wes's throat here, just briefly. Um, <laughs> I think. Briefly. <laughs> so oh, Hitchcockian. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I mean, I think that Hitchcock actually said that uh, North by Northwest was the plot was just like a you know a, a clothesline to hang a whole bunch of set pieces on, and in a w so in a way, it's like the whole movie's an excuse for him to do these set pieces he wanted to do. Yeah. So I mean, it's I think it's kind of hard to. I mean, I love it. It's it's super fun. It's like high grade popcorn. Yeah. But I mean, to say that it's Hitchcock's best movie, I I, I sort of can't. Well, see again, it. I'm I'm not saying it's it's the best movie he ever made. I'm saying it's the most it's, it's the, the best Hitchcock. Hitchcock movie. Was that the one where the, there were some one of them? It was one of these two that the screenwriter said, "I was set out to write the Hitchcockiest Hick Hitchcock film ever." That yeah. they actually deliberately wrote yeah, it that way. Yeah, and it it's <laughs> the best example of I mean. The majority of his films are comic thrillers, and none of them are, are better than that. I mean, I love the line like when Cary Grant has to get, a, get his um, his clothing cleaned, and he's he's in this hotel room with Eva Marie Saint, and he goes, 
God, what can a guy do with his clothes gone in 30 minutes? You know, because that's the length of time they're going to take to bring it back. I mean, it's just farce, farce, farce. Okay, we'll throw in a little thriller, and then it's just. So I think it's a really delightful mix of what he did best, and nobody seems to acknowledge that as much as. One thing I'll point out about uh, Psycho is the only one that he actually won, or I believe, yeah, he was nominated for Best Director for Psycho, but not for either uh, North by Northwest or Vertigo. Also, both of those had to be reevaluated. They were both actually sort of disliked at the time. And then critics had to go back and go, well, actually, no, they're not bad. They're not bad. We like them. Now that we've decided Hitchcock is brilliant, we're going to go back and say that these were probably brilliant. Psycho was loved at the time. Um, I don't think you should disregard you know, what public opinion um, is because a director's ability to read what the public will enjoy and the kind of narrative they'll enjoy um, I think is important. And it was, Psycho was so successful when it came out, they reissued it and sent it out again in 65, and it did gangbusters then as well. So it's something where it's, um, it, the film was acknowledged for being brilliant at the time and in its time period and didn't need to be reevaluated um, with this sort of lens of Hitchcock is brilliant. You know, the psychiatrist thing at the end doesn't work for me in Psycho. The, uh, you know, I mean, it's actually a great acting turn by, I don't, I don't mm -hmm. know who that guy is, I can't remember. Mm -hmm. It's a great acting turn by that guy, but the stuff he says is such horse shit. <laughs> You mean you don't feel like you could just go in there? You, you have some questions about the psychology well, and psycho? It's, it's kind of condescending, too, because it, 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 it suggests that we don't get it. It's, it's sort of like in Schindler's List, you know, when Schindler gets a conscience because we have to have that little girl in the ghetto get a red dress on, and that pops up, and it's like, I get it. You don't need to, you know, it's sort of like spoon feeding. For it me. does so seem like they were afraid the audience w wouldn't get it. I mean, yeah. that seems to be why he's there. Yeah. The yeah. audience yeah. seemed to be okay with that because they liked it a lot. Well, okay. But I think also, you know, th a good sign of a good director is a great performance. And Anthony Perkins was never more brilliant than he was in that movie. I mean, he, I, I think you'd be hard pressed to ever find anybody who could play Norman Bates with any uh, great. And Vince Vaughn, come on, no, Vince Vaughn. No, and Anthony Perkins was never. I mean, you watch him in any other movie, and he just doesn't work. So Hitchcock got he's this. Norman Bates. No. Well, cause they, but Hitchcock <laughs> got such a performance out of it. Yeah, and it ruined you know? his career. And uh, <laughs> yes, it did. And it was it was a cursed film. I'm not terribly thrilled about the fact that it actually created the horror genre. So I have some mixed yeah. feelings. Well, see, the, the one thing I mean, it it, it actually helped change the horror film <laughs> with uh, with uh, Peeping Tom, which came out ironically enough the same year, a British film, but which made horror contemporary instead of more likely to be in Transylvania or something mm. like that. But one of my gripes against it is that um, everybody says Hitchcock and horror, and, and you know he did some horror. He did Frenzy. He did Birds. Maybe you want to go back to silent films. He did The Lodger, but um, he he was a comic thriller guy, and that's why I picked maybe not the greatest movie ever made, but the greatest Hitchcock movie that was typical of him is, is North by Northwest, I believe. And it was a huge hit at the time. And it starred his favorite actor, and uh, Cary Grant, and, uh, and I thought uh, a delightful role. So. You know about this hideous continuity error in North by Northwest, right, where the kid covers his ears uh -huh. in the, um, in the uh, Mount Rushmore cafeteria right before Eva Marie Saint discharges the fake pistol. A kid yeah. covers his ears, one of the yeah. extra kids covers his ears. That's why you ears, don't so. work with children. <laughs> so like, where was Hitchcock in the cutting room that day? Well, Not looking at the kids. Yeah, a little, well, uh, the answer to that's, that, that's the answer points off right there. That's points Hitchcock, off. Hitchcock thought it was done when the script was done. You know, well, once you had the script, the movie was finished, well, everything there's else a, was There's a continuity side. area at the end of uh, City Lights um, where um, we don't know what the blind girl's gonna like uh, Charlie or or not, and uh, there's a major continuity area. And, and Chaplin always said, "If you're noticing continuity errors, then I've lost. I don't care." <laughs> that would be the answer. <laughs> Probably would be the fair enough. Answer. Yeah. Okay. So we'll go with our 30 second rebuttals. We'll start with Catherine this time. Go to Pat and finish with Wes. Um. All right, so my thought is, uh, so I'll, I'll read this quote from uh, the critical consensus of Rotten Tomatoes, which is, is infamous for its shower scene, but immortal for its contribution to the horror genre. Because Psycho was filmed with tact, grace, and art, Hitchcock didn't just create modern horror, he validated it. The other thing that I really love about it is that, it w which is not terribly common for Hitchcock films, is it actually has a female protagonist who has agency. She actually does something. Um, I, she, she even gets a full arc, even though she's sort of killed in her a redemptive baptism, but um, Marion Crane is actually a compelling character. Oh, sorry. Oh. That's okay. We have lots of people that go over and I'm like, stop, 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 stop. Yeah. Yeah. truncated. But no, you guys, you guys are doing great. Awesome. Go ahead, Pat. All right. Well, I'm going to say that a movie that looks better today than it did when it came out is a, is, is a great movie. You know, uh, a, a really good test of what's a good movie is has it held up? And I would say that a movie that's that looks better 
40 years after it was made is that I think that's a really impressive thing. I also think, you know, Vertigo, you can watch it 10 times and still keep seeing things. I don't think that's the case for North by Northwest. Um, and finally, I think it, it's the most Hitchcockian movie because Hitchcock was obsessed with looking. And this is a movie about looking. All right. And we'll finish off with Wes. Well, to me, again, I'm, I'm just going back to what I feel is central to Hitchcock. Uh, everything about North by Northwest is uh, great. M my favorite villain, James Mason. Yeah, and Hitchcock always related to the villains more, which is scary, but uh, <laughs> whatever. Uh, I have favorite uh, um, actor, Cary Grant, in it, and it's got a lot of set pieces. It's got the greatest MacGuffin. It's got, you know, um, it just fits that comic thriller a zone that I feel is central to him. All right, all right. Any facts to check Vaughn? Everything checked out. Okie dokie. Anybody have thought? Oh, oh, Stuart's got a thought. Nobody said Rear Window or Notorious. I do like Rear Window. Come that on. was that's probably my second choice. But yeah, I don't know who wins. Good luck. Oh, okay. I was surprised to see Rear Window didn't show up myself. I, I just had to study Rear Window too much in school and didn't <laughs> have to deal with it again. Let's <laughs> go. <laughs> I love it, but it was and like it wouldn't have existed now without air conditioning. That's why yeah. yeah. the first didn't happen either. Yeah. Let's get, get this on birds. the table. There are a lot of scary things about Hitchcock. Yeah, <laughs> as a human <laughs> being. <laughs> yeah, yeah. strange, yeah. strange person. Yeah. Okay, gosh, now I have to make decisions. Hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I was about to just start talking about bats and ice cream again. Yeah, <laughs> bats and ice cream. Yeah. So bats, huh? Yeah. So bats. Um, let's see. I'm going to give first place to Pat. Oh, yes. Second place to Wes. And I'm sorry, Catherine. It's all right. Third place. But, and it's not that... And it, it was so close. You all made very compelling arguments. So I think nice where name. these two got you is that they made a strong argument that their films were very much Hitchcockian. Where yours was, it's a, it's a great film and it was revolutionary and it did create its own genre, but it wasn't as indicative of the Hitchcock style that the others yeah. were. Um, yeah. Pat, so I'm giving you. We followed instructions better. <laughs> we read the question carefully. I'm not. I'm not a huge fan of Hitchcock. <laughs> I admit. <laughs> what? I, good thing you held that till after the judging. I was, you know, I, <laughs> I, I, I respect. I respect. Mm -hmm. But if I'm gonna sit down on a Saturday, it's probably not gonna be watched. A Hitchcock movie. And then Pat, I'm giving you first place because I think you made a strong argument that Vertigo has held up better than North by Northwest. Uh, Wes, you made a very strong case that North by Northwest is a probably about the Hitchcockiest of the Hitchcock films, but it may not have held up to mo as well to modern viewing audiences as Vertigo today. So Vertigo kind of hit that nice sweet spot where it's like, also it's the most Hitchcockian, but it's also maybe the most enjoyable to watch. It's also gorgeous, it really is. A oh yeah. yeah, like didn't they create, Beautiful film. didn't he create the whole camera effect where you like the zoom in and the yeah. and The, the Jaws hypnotic. thing. I mean, it is, yeah. it's a hypnotic yeah. film to watch. Yeah. Makes you want to go to San Francisco and have a nervous breakdown. <laughs> <laughs> what doesn't, doesn't? I mean, really? Yeah. <laughs> Isn't that the only reason people go to San Francisco? You know? Just go to Lombard exactly. Street now. Well, there's <laughs> also clam chowder. Oh, that is true. Clam, clam chowder and nervous breakdown. <laughs> that's, that's what it says on their welcome sign. Yeah. <laughs> Jump into the, the ocean and see if Jimmy Stewart comes to get me. <laughs> yeah. so, so to reiterate, first place goes to Pat, second place to Wes, third place to Catherine. So speaking of relevance, as we said, um, Vertigo is relevant to today. What classic film is the most relevant to today's times and goings on, going ons, goings on, goings on? So who hasn't started? I don't think Wes has started the intro yet. Well, this was a tricky question because uh, so many things are going on today that almost any film you would pick, <laughs> <laughs> you could you could pencil it in. Mm -hmm. But I went with modern times because. Uh, uh, I'm a Chaplin freak anyway, but Modern Times has the machine uh, swallow up Charlie Chaplin. And I feel in our overly checked emails and texts and tweeting and everything like that, it, it's, it's got all, it's, it's more timely now than, it, than it's ever been in history. Um, uh, it inspired George Orwell to come up with Big Brother and the, the, the screens in different rooms. Uh, it, it's all about, you know, the whole kind of uh, paranoia about politics. Um, the left at the time thought it was too conservative, and the right thought, oh my gosh, you know, they had a rough red flag, and of course, so it was in black and white. Um, 
It was, it's the most cherry-picked one of all Chaplin's films. Red Skelton, Lucy, Bob Hope, and Bing Crosby, Dick Van Dyke. Everybody's taken material from that particular film. Awesome. We'll go to Catherine next. Uh, I chose uh, George Cukor's 1944 version of Gaslight. Um, it's not an overtly political film, and that's actually part of why I think it's relevant, is because what it's actually doing is it's a, it's a film that uh, is demonstrating a manipulation technique. Um, and actually, it coined the term gaslighting. The reason why we have the term gaslighting is because of the film and the, the play Gaslight. Um, and so gaslighting uh, is, the psychological manipulation is, uh, oh sorry, the definition is a form of manipulation that seeks to sow seeds of doubt in targeted individuals or members of a targeted group, hoping to make them question their own memory, perception, or sanity. Um, for example, like maybe looking at two pictures of a crowd size and insisting one is larger than the other when you can see that it's not. Um, that's gaslighting. Mm. And uh, I, so I think it's something that's very, very relevant. In fact, it became uh, more used in, in, uh, in talks this last, these last year, this last year or so. Very nice. And we'll finish off with Pat. Okay. My um, most relevant film to today's going ons, goings on is uh, The Manchurian Candidate, 1962 film, John Frankenheimer starring Frank Sinatra. Um, I don't think I have to say more than this is a movie about a hostile foreign power intervening in a U.S. election um, and a movie about the ways an emerging media form can be used to manipulate the public. Um, so, and you know, you know what's a great, a tremendous uh, accident here is that we're both talking about Scary Angela Lansbury. Yes. <laughs> scary Angela Lansbury yes. is in Gaslight and Scary Angela Lansbury. She is. Mrs. Potts is here and she's going to kick your ass. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> she means business. Uh, I'll say more about the Manchurian Candidate later, but I mean, basically, it's a movie in which a, a, a secret plot to manipulate public opinion messes with a U.S. election. Um, in, in kind of the most terrifying, unsettling way imaginable. And so I'll say more about it later. Awesome, awesome. Well, let's get straight to it then. Five minute four. It's like, I, I've got some plans already. Like, give you, I'll just preview the fact that I'm coming. I've got, I've got this is my intimidation let's, strategy. Uh -huh. Let's hear it, Pat. I'm intimidated. <laughs> Well, okay, so Raymond Shaw, the character played by Lawrence Harvey, uh, is brainwashed in Korea into becoming an assassin. And uh, they, they train him to, uh, someone, his cue is someone says, why don't, you pl why don't you pass the time by playing some solitaire? And when he sees the Queen of Diamonds, that means that he's ready to be ordered and he goes and gets orders to kill people, right? Um, but the thing that's really, I think, contemporary about this is, first of all, it's the Soviet Union intervening illegally in an American election. And also, all through the movie, Frankenheimer had been a TV director. He was a director of, like, Playhouse 90 and stuff like that. And uh, uh, the movie, there are TVs and TV cameras and TV monitors everywhere in this movie. Angela Lansbury is manipulating TV, which is the new emergent media that everybody's scared about. Uh, and its effects on public opinion. There's a great scene where her husband, uh, James, played by James Gregor, he's a senator. He's a McCarthyite figure, right? Uh, he's giving a press conference, and she's sitting next to the, t the TV monitor, watching the TV monitor, like sort of uh, almost like greedily. And like, you know, she rises in triumph after he does this great performance at the press conference. So this is a movie about about the manipulation of mass opinion, about new media being used to um, undermine democratic institutions. I really can't think of anything more relevant. Well, for me, I think just modern times is, uh, just in the title, pretty much says that uh, we're all having nervous breakdowns here because uh, we haven't checked something in the last eight seconds that, you know, I'm at the mall and I'm getting a ice cream or something like that. Um, it also is about human dignity and the fact that uh, it was a commentary on uh, um, mass production and the whole idea of craftsmanship leaving uh, America. Uh, it was also Chaplin attempting in, in his, his own way to put a lot of what he had done before, because this was supposed to be his last film, uh, and he was going to retire until he did The Great Dictator. And so he put together um, a lot of things that he felt, or he hoped anyway, would be pertinent for the for the future, and uh, as, a, as a youngster, he had worked around machines, and he'd always had this nightmarish thrill, uh, s fear that he would be swallowed up um, by mm. the machine, and, and, and that particular thing happened. Um, the other thing I wanted to mention, I, I was kind of getting to it quickly, but um, 
it's been the most cherry picked film and I've you know, I've written a lot of books on a lot of comedies of all the all the stuff. Uh, the assembly line with Lucy, you know, and the chocolates. Um, uh, a lot of people won't remember Red Skelton, but uh, the whole bit about uh, eating a big meal that he can't afford at Christmas so he could be put in jail as uh, his Freddy the Freeloader of the Tramp was used. The Dick Van Dyke opening, uh, is he going to fall over the ottoman or not? That That's out of that particular film. Uh, there's a scene where uh, Charlie Chaplin has an automatic feeding machine going uh, and he can't use his hands because it's all mechanization. Uh, Hope and Crosby borrowed, stole, uh, uh, embellished that in one of the road pictures. Um, I think what's uh, what's interesting about both of these, though, is that they're they're relevant and they have been relevant for a while. The idea of, of being taken yeah. over by machines is something that we've been we've been afraid of. Every time yeah. there's a new technology, we have some idea that now we're no longer who we were. Um, clearly, we've had Russian fears for a long while. <laughs> we went to a whole Cold War kind of thing. Um, uh, gaslighting has specifically become, and especially in 2017, I think is particularly relevant because within the story we have a woman who is specifically being manipulated by her husband, and it's the gender dynamics are ex especially important there. Um, that, for example, the reason why it's called gaslight is there's a flickering gaslight that she sees because he's doing things. She's, he says, "Oh no, no, it's not that light's not flickering. What you're seeing is not there." And so I think what we have is mm. this specific gender dynamic of a, a woman being accused of being hysterical because her perception of reality is being questioned, deliberately undermined. So not only do we have sort of gaslighting happening um, to, on a wider scale, but we also, as we kind of see with stuff happening in Hollywood, mm -hmm. this idea that women have not been believed largely up to this point, and so mm -hmm. that when women have been saying certain things about the Hollywood and this kind of thing, that that has never been believed and women are hysterical and they're, they're not seeing the truth, which just is this ex large example of gaslighting um, that we're seeing in 2017 that but, it's become. But she's, she's not really a heroine for today, though, right? I mean, she's uh, she's totally the damsel in distress. I mean, she does finally get to lord it over Charles Boyer. Who, who are the damsels that are in uh, the Manchurian Candida? I mean, we do have Angela Lansbury in, uh, in Gaslight being part of the whole system, right? W women undermining other women. Um, so we have somebody in there who's, it's, we're seeing not just the damsel side of women, we are seeing the fact that they can also be part of the, of the system. Ooh. Interesting. Buzzer shot. <laughs> Bam! Angela Lansbury. <laughs> Angela Lansbury. <laughs> Angela Lansbury. That's, That's all you need. <laughs> That's all you need Let's to get know. Throw things down whenever I say Angela. Lansbury. Second buzzword of the day: <laughs> Angela <laughs> Lansbury. Take a drink. Worth a Google. <laughs> water. Okay. Uh, let's see. For our finishing, we'll start with Pat, then go to Catherine, and finish off with Wes. Um, I'm just going to say I don't think Gaslight's heroine is a heroine for today. She's she's so weak. In, um, uh, Bergman uh, didn't want to play her because she was so sort of weak and retiring. Modern Times, I mean, that movie stands up. It's amazing. But it's about a different time than our time. I mean, it's about industrialization, and we're really in a post-industrial world now. Um. Oh, then we'll go to Kat. Oh, is it me? Okay, we'll go to Wes. I was no. gonna say, Wes, if you got a thought, go for it. Yeah. it. No, I was just, I was just gonna yeah. say, um, but the ongoing dehumanization, the loss of individuality, the whole uh, tech world that's kind of pulling us in eighty-four different directions. I see that starting in modern times, or at least I'm recognizing that. And uh, we even have, um, uh, you know, he used Henry Ford as the whole assembly line kind of thing to uh, demonstrate the ability that. Craftsmanship is gone. People are, you know, not as interested in what they're doing now at work, and we're losing who we are. Uh. Yeah. And we'll finish off with Kath. Yes. So, um, I think you're absolutely right that uh, Bergman's um, uh, damsel, you know, is is very passive in the film. But I think that's actually part of the whole point: is that she, how how confident are you really supposed to be when literally somebody you trust is telling you the things you're seeing aren't real? Um, and so she spends a lot of the time thinking she's going mad. Um, and so part of that whole concept is that somebody who would not be weak, who would otherwise have a full life, is actually being undermined by the people that love her. Um, and so that we end up getting people who are not being allowed to have their full potential, and, and I think we're seeing a lot of that. Okay. Any facts to check, Vaughn? These folks just love telling the truth. Well, They're making the job easy. We do. We do. Yeah. We, do. we appreciate it. I don't that. agree with gaslighting. Oh, okay. <laughs> Uh, anyone have thoughts? You got thoughts, Stuart? Yes, yeah, sorry. <coughs> I have a, a lot of thoughts, but I just would say I, I'd pick Network from 1976. I think that's a very good... Because you're mad as hell and you yeah. don't take it anymore? Uh, but in terms of like advice just to Mark, um, 
I don't know. This may be like kind of a long shot, but it, and he's not just because he's my professor, but I think I would pick Wes on this one. Um, just sta- point of was, order. Just he was the keep most keep that in mind when you are <laughs> greedy. My final exam. Yeah. But I think he got the most attacks uh, in turn, and I think he held him pr- pretty mm-hmm. well. So it's, but it's very minuscule. So I know. Good luck with that. Yeah, that's the thing about this. Since you're all, you know, academic people, you all know what you're talking about. Which is, there's always, which is hard because there's always one person in our fights that don't know what they're talking about. But I can't do that. With <laughs> <laughs> yeah, usually you're it's saying me. that you're saying that now. But yeah, you know, now, uh, yeah, yeah. It's like uh, usually well, it's I'm me. I'm the only one that doesn't actually teach a a film studies class, so you might. I, I think I can be the dunce of the group. <laughs> well, I must but say the, the question, though, you, you could have picked a lot of different. I mean, we all could have picked a lot. It was a really tricky oh, one for yeah. me to come up with what's the. It became which one do I want to talk about. I, 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 wanted to, I almost went with all the president's men, you know. You oh, could have gone all the yeah. king's men. I mean, there's just, uh, there's just a zillion. Yeah. Modern time there's all I have to say, Catherine, you, there was more to the, you had, there's more to the gaslight argument than I would have thought. Thank you. I do mm-hmm. think, that, I mean, you know. I don't think that movie holds up that well. I oh, mean, it no, seems I don't, to I don't, me I don't like the. So yeah. it was, but what I think is relevant, um, I think it's fascinating that it launched a term. Right. Like when you like, right. what, why, why do we call it gaslighting? Well, because there was this movie about Ingrid Bergman where there yeah. was, the, you know what I mean? My <laughs> sister yeah. actually asked for that movie for Christmas this year. Yep. Yep. So I think she's getting it. I'm not sure yet. My parents are getting it for her. I hope she's not watching this. This is like the ice cream. Is she gonna get ice cream? You're not really. Yeah, she. Get we all get. <laughs> you're gaslighting her with the movie Gaslight. <laughs> you you thought you're gonna get it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Whoa. Yeah. Application. Very meta. This is very yeah, professorial. Yes, Whoa. yes. You know, I love classical Hollywood acting, but the acting in that movie seems old-fashioned even to me. Well, Charles they're using Bo- Charles gas lights. They're Charles not even using electric lights. Out, Matt, uh, Matt, Pat is fighting me after the bell. <laughs> this, is, this is the game is called. The ref is standing there, and he's still punching me in the face. There were never any instructions out, about it. This is against <laughs> MMA rules entirely. Okay. This is, he's just like, well, okay. well, you know what? We're just chatting here. Allow me to tear down your <laughs> 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 I know. It starts out so innocuous. He's like, I just want to say that. He's doing it so pleasantly. Yeah. Yeah. Cheating so pleasantly no, I, right I, in front of the judge. <laughs> Okay. Quiet. <laughs> Quiet, everyone. I'm in Sharia Canada. Let me me think. Shut up. Okay. Shut it. <laughs> okay. So, I'm going to get I'm going to give first place to Wes. Second place to Catherine. Oh. Uh, <laughs> and thought, third place thought. to Pat. I, it was close. I'm <laughs> telling you, it's points apart, you know. It's it's the the wind shifts I'm giving first place to Pat because I think Stuart did make a great point that you, to yeah, I mean to Wes, yes, yeah. to Wes, first place to Wes, because I think Stuart did make a great point. You did go under a lot of attack, but you held up really well, and Modern Times is one of those movies, it, it pervades the entire culture, not just a specific event in the day, it pervades the entire atmosphere of Modern Times as it is today. Uh, Catherine, I'm giving second place to you because I thought you made a great case. You kind of had the underdog, but you made a great case in that it coined an entire term that is still used today, and it's very relevant today with the whole entire Hollywood scandal. And just um, uh, female, what's the word I'm looking for? Disconnect between male and female perceptions uh, that's prevalent today. Pat, I'm giving you third place. You're you're entirely correct. The Manchurian candidate is relevant because of the of the Russia election scandal um, today. But I think it covers. It, it's better suited to that event rather to today's culture. And so I think while it it's very possible to say yes, this is relevant today. In a couple in a couple years but still within this generation will it still be as prevalent and as applicable so to reiterate i'm giving first place to wes second place to Catherine, third place to pat and we're gonna before we get to the last question which is the double points round let's get a quick score update page they all currently have six points of course oh, they geez. do <laughs> of course they do the barn burner what yeah. i want to point out is that we all came up with kind of you know depressing relevance yeah. Why couldn't we be like singing in the rain? Because <laughs> I am happy and the weather's, you know. Yeah. I sing singing in the rain when it's like raining, you know? Yeah. Of course. <laughs> I almost <laughs> chose Star Wars because I'm like, because it won't go away. Like, it's still around. It's still yeah. going. No. I see Wookiees all the time. I see Wookiees constantly. <laughs> see Wookiees all the time. I see dead Wookiees. <laughs> <laughs> I see dead Wookiees. <laughs> 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 so, 
Speaking of relevance, let's get a blast from the past, shall we? Which classic film star would be as popular today if they were still making movies? So, who, has everyone started in the intro round? I yes. think. Yeah, we've all so done. then we'll go back to the way it was first round. We'll start with Catherine, go to Wes, and then Pat. The opposite of what I wanted you to do. <laughs> all right. Uh, I chose Marilyn Monroe because, well, I think she still is relevant. I mean, she's she's iconic um, to this day. Iconic, you said? Iconic. She's <laughs> iconic. Iconic. <laughs> Woo! Yeah. Um, so one of the things, uh, I think she was uh, undervalued for her time. Uh, you know, she played the dumb blonde role, but she was actually quite brilliant and quite shrewd. Um, and one of the things I think was really uh, what stood out to me about her is I think that she was somebody who wanted to be honest at a time when Hollywood wanted polish. Um, I think she would have been somebody who would thrive with this policy of now of like having Instagram and actually blogging and sharing your actual feelings and being the, the celebrity that you are. Because I think that's the person who's become quite iconic is the honest human being that she was. Um, I think she struggled beneath the studio system that needed her to be something very tidy and prim all the time because that's not really what her personality was. Um, and so I think that she was ahead of her time. Uh, she was quite brilliant uh, and I think would have flourished in a time where she could have had more freedom. All right, all right. We'll go to West then. Well, I'm going with Jimmy Stewart, and it's largely based on, uh, God, I've been here forever, uh, almost 40 years of teaching. And uh, when I show movies, my students consistently, he's the most popular. And it's not because I'm pushing him. Uh, I'd probably go with, uh, well, I'd definitely go with Chaplin, but uh, or somebody like Clark Gable. But be that as it may, um, I was just going through the AFI top uh, 100 films, and in the top 50 films, there are five Jimmy Stewart films. I mean, he's literally 10% of the of what you know the people who are supposed to know know. Um, the other thing that's fascinating about him is the fact that pre-war, he's shucks, uh, you know, shy, the boy next door kind of thing. He was uh, the most decorated veteran out of Hollywood from World War II, and he suffered post-traumatic stress, and he kind of changed his whole. Um, his style after after uh, the war with, with movies like Row, uh, uh, Vertigo, uh, The Naked Spur, and it partly was based on that boy next door thing we had before. And we'll finish with Pat. Once again, I'm arguing against somebody who you can't argue against. In the case of uh, Jimmy Stewart, I mean, you know, everybody loves Jimmy Stewart. He was the Tom Hanks of his day, or really, with the reverse would be more the case. I'm uh, my underdog is Henry Fonda, who is his best friend and roommate. Um, and, you know, in a way, I think his career is the opposite of Jimmy Stewart's. I think in the early performances of uh, Henry Fonda, there's a kind of like a combination of vulnerability and volatility um, that is really something else and really like sort of unmatched anywhere else. And then when he in his maturity, he's sort of like the cowboy and, you know, and the golden pond, you know, uh, cranky grandpa. Um, but I think if you look at his early films, I think that he has a kind of a range and a kind of distinctiveness that would go over really well today. He could be, he could be both vulnerable and dangerous and a little off, and he could do that in a comedy or in a drama, and I think that he would do really well like now in the sort of independent film era. All right. And I heard... Uh, Henry Fonda and Jimmy Stewart were on the opposite side of the aisle in terms of politics. Is that correct? That yeah, totally. They yeah. supposedly had a fist fight in '47 yeah. uh, about the politics. Happened. I thought Fonda said that never happened. Really? Well, fact checker. <laughs> no, <laughs> one of their daughters said it did, but mm -hmm. you know, can, I can go either way on it. But yeah, one was way to the left, one was way to the right. So. Mm -hmm. yep. uh, yeah. And they're Which both great. And chance. Henry Fonda yep. was the conservative. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I yeah, yeah. Well, I, see, so, I yeah. thought it was Jimmy Stewart that was the conservative. I could be. No, Jimmy Hell Stewart. Jimmy Stewart was the conservative. Oh, okay. Jimmy okay. Stewart was the conservative because he, one of his adopted sons died in Vietnam, and he was real, you know. Uh, and, oh. and Fonda was. He was a hawk. Yeah. yeah. Jimmy Stewart was quite oh, the hawk. Oh, that's right. Fonda, yeah. Yeah. Fonda was Jane Fonda's dad. Yeah. That's yeah, right. yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. So. And Peter Fonda. He yeah. 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 Jane yeah Fonda. So. Um, Lefties. Okay. Well, now we're just chatting about people. Well, then let's go straight into the fight. Take that energy and. Kill somebody, but not literally. Like okay, I just, I just, figuratively kill someone. I just <laughs> jumped, I jumped on uh, Stewart because like the actor of the day of everyone loves is, is Tom Hanks, and they constantly refer to it to the, the Jimmy Stewart factor. And then the other thing about Jimmy Stewart that that was interesting from the classic age of, of, of performers, they had a persona and they stayed with it. And in the like Gable, right to the end in the Misfits, he wouldn't do one particular scene because Clark Gable wouldn't do that particular scene, whereas. Uh, I'll I'll go to uh, your Vertigo. Uh, in Vertigo, I mean, 
uh, Fonda, I mean Fonda, um, Jimmy Stewart is scary in that. I mean, he, yeah. he expresses fear. Uh, he, he actually shows the dark side of Alfred Hitchcock is really, because it's a director about how a director manipulates a woman and things like that. So yeah. When we look at all of these, though, I think that we can't argue about who necessarily was talented because, first of all, they're all talented. Second of all, it doesn't actually have anything to do with how popular someone is. You know, we, the, we, we've seen lots of times people who are not that talented become excessively popular. So, or, uh, and so I, I don't know that necessarily talent is, is really that relevant. One of the things that I, um, what I think is interesting about Marilyn Monroe is that she, for not having made that many films or whatever, she continues to actually still resonate with, with young people, that she actually, um, Strangely enough, she has a Facebook page. These other <laughs> two people don't. I'll just point that out. She has 3.3 million people on her. On her I'm going to start a Henry Fonda page right <laughs> after. I'm going to start a Henry so. Fonda Facebook page. And that's, that doesn't really necessarily mean anything other than there's something about her performances that is still kind of resonating and speaking to people. Um, and she did. She kind of played that, that dumb blonde kind of character, but there was um, an intelligence beneath it where she, when she got into more dramatic roles, she actually was getting quite uh, good reviews about it. And actually, Roger Ebert said at one point, because, you know, she had a lot of neuroses. She was kind of a strange person in a lot of ways. But he said the reason why directors kept putting up with it is because what you got on screen was magical. Um, and mm. I think that that's when you kind of have those people who are unique on screen. You know, that you that they there is something about them that is beyond the words they're given, beyond the roles they're playing, that there's some sort of energy, they, that it factor. Uh, one, I love, love Marilyn Monroe. I, I, I did a book on the 50s, and I, I purposely did it because I didn't want her to be designated as a dumb blonde. Mm -hmm. Uh, and so I, I really respect her work and everything, but uh, today I don't know if she could work. I mean, the stability factor was, I, I think she would just fall to pieces right now. Yeah, in terms yeah, of yeah, and I, and I think there's actually reason to believe that. I also think that she did the best she could within a system that was profound. I mean, we're we're seeing to this day what what the system is like for for talented women, and especially for women who, uh, you know, were were they had the roles that Marilyn Monroe did. Um, she was constantly pushing back against studio systems. I mean, she created yeah. her own production house because she wanted out of her contract with MGM and they wouldn't allow her to have it. They weren't letting her be in bigger roles. They weren't letting her take on more. Yeah. Um, so I think if she was in a system where she could give a bit more of that pushback, I think that now she would be, I think part of, I mean, this is me psychoanalyzing Marilyn Monroe, <laughs> but I, I think how do you not have self-esteem issues when you are constantly treated a certain way at the studios and you know you kind of grew up a certain way she did so um in some i'm not saying all of it would have been gone um i'm just saying that she managed to have a thriving career while having all these issues and i think <coughs> some of those issues had to do with the fact that she was fighting so hard to have a career okay. as much as i like her i think she she would be current now but i'm afraid she'd be current with reality tv or um famous because she's famous kind of thing and not for like movies or quality uh, work. Uh, and and, and, and this is from- called her a shrewd businesswoman. I think that she could have, yeah. yeah. I and mean, I'm saying this from a, from a Marilyn Monroe fan, but I, I don't know if she would hold up uh, right now. Uh, but she represents maybe the time in, in to a certain degree. But now in our last minute, we need to attack uh, Henry Fonda apparently because <laughs> yeah. Henry Fonda's yeah. looking yeah. at the cracks. <laughs> 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 Well, I mean, I you know, I I mean, I just want to so, sort of point out that you know the question is who would be popular today, but I'm just going to strategically ignore that question <laughs> and say that I think Henry Fonda is the bomb. Um, okay. You know, I mean, I'm thinking about you know, I'm thinking about range here, right? He is the romantic lead in the screwball comedy, The Lady Eve. He's Tom Joad. Right, a really underrated, really bizarre film noir called *The Long Night*, where he's holed up in an apartment above the street for like the, the whole, basically the 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 movie is told in flashback as he's surrounded by the police. And in all of these movies, he's funny, vulnerable, scary, a little volatile, and but differently in each I, movie. I, I got a counter to that though with with Jimmy Stewart. I mean, in Harvey, he's talking to bunnies, and in Vertigo, he's friggin' scary. You know, so. Bunnies, and I'm shaping this woman in however I want her. I guess I'm not uh, sure Harvey really is that much of a of, of a hard uh, hitting, it was one of hard hitting bunny it interrogation. It was picked as one of the what 35th best comedy, but and really, yeah, yeah. I was Harvey, Harvey was. It it's was legendary in my family. Yeah, I, I am. I do have Harvey. On <laughs> and we're being told to shut oh, yeah. up. They want us to stop. Yeah, Paige will get aggressive with that bell. Thank you, Paige. She can make a bell sound very intimidating. That's good. Okay, we'll go the other way. We'll start with Pat, then Wes, and then Catherine for the conclusions. 
Well, uh, I think I said everything I have to say about Henry Fonda. Um, and so I guess I have to attack Jimmy Stewart, which is impossible. <laughs> and created a great mental picture. And Sorry. Marilyn Monroe, which, you know, I'm just kind of not in a position to do. Um, you know, okay, so I'll say this. Henry Fonda played a herpetologist who was a beer magnate's son in The Lady Eve. What could be better? <laughs> That's it. That's all I got. That is one heck of a rhetorical question. <laughs> <laughs> what could be better than a herpetologist? <laughs> For our viewers back home, a herpetologist is a scientist who studies reptiles. Fact check. Yeah, fact check. Fact check. What's <laughs> a herpetologist? Sure. Yes. I'm sorry. That's one of my favorite things I've heard. Okay. <laughs> Go ahead. What? Okay, for for me again, it, it's Jimmy Stewart. I think he adjusted his career as he went along, and after World War II, um, he he went from uh, movies like uh, Philadelphia Story to movies like Rope uh, or The Naked Spur or uh, Winchester Seventy Three, and these are film warish westerns. You might not know the name Anthony Mann, but he's one of the great directors that's so uh, not got enough credit. And then he did, he, he put himself in risky positions with Hitchcock all the time. Um. Okay, and we'll finish off with Catherine. All right, since I can't attack either of those fi- folks because I like them, uh, I am just going <laughs> to read a quote from Ella Fitzgerald about uh, Marilyn Monroe because it's an awesome story and everybody should know it. She says, I owe Marilyn Monroe a real debt. It was because of her that I played the Macombo, a very popular nightclub in the 50s. She personally called the owner and told him she wanted me booked immediately, and if he would do it, she would take the front table every night. She told him, and it was true, due to Marilyn's superstar status, that the press would go wild. The owner said yes, and Marilyn was there, front table every night. The press went overboard. After that, I never had to play a small jazz club again. She was an unusual woman, a little ahead of her time. She didn't even know it. Hmm. Okay, facts to check, Vaughn. So Henry Fonda and Jimmy Stewart were on other or different aisles of the political spectrum um, with Henry Fonda being liberal and Jimmy Stewart being conservative. I couldn't find any sources indicating that they got into a physical altercation over political differences. I did, however, find a lot of articles that said that they put their differences aside. They um, made airplanes. And <laughs> yeah, they made airplanes and didn't talk about politics. And, uh, they did, they did. And herpetologists study not only reptiles but also amphibians. Also amphibians. <laughs> <laughs> So reptiles of the w- sea. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> yes, <laughs> you know, the one th- of land and sea. Cardinal uh, zoology fights is next. Is Exa- in the next studio. Exactly. Right? I used zoology. to make challenging me now to that one. <laughs> <laughs> I used to make the joke that Cardinal film fights wasn't really a, a film debate show. It was where we take cardinals, fight them against each other, and then we film it. You know. But no. <laughs> no, I like birds. Yeah. yeah, I do too. Birds are underrated. That is. Except in the birds, and then we Except, don't like yeah, them. Yeah. Like, I don't know, I'm not yeah, too. Then the table's but when you, well, when you look at that one from a feminist perspective, man, that movie gets weird. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, <laughs> birds. <laughs> Wait, from, from vertigo to, uh, you know, poor Tippy Hedren to poor whatever, Tippy. yeah. Uh, yes, I mean. Uh. Yeah, that's why I prefer bats in my Dairy Queen, not yeah, birds. Yeah, it turns out the whole thing about the birds is her fault. <laughs> because she has desire. Yes, <laughs> how dare she in that little green suit. Yeah. Yes. Oh, yeah, I'm supposed to be Tiffany Hedren. If a sexy well, girl's well, desire comes to your town. Oh, is this <laughs> <a> <laughs> yeah. And, uh, and also, whenever you're on a playground, just check out for jungle jump. Yeah. And, you know, and, and if there's a lot of birds there, there yeah, still. basically. Stuart, you have thoughts, Stuart? Yeah, I do have thoughts. Um, first off, thank you all for coming on the show. Yeah. You're all great. Thank you very much. I don't know how you're going to judge this, Mark, because this was argued very well. And yeah all three sides. I personally would have gone with Howard Hawks because I think he plays to the audience and is directing his films um, as a director. But I really liked Gardner's point about Marilyn Monroe being like an Instagram hit. That's like a, that's very true. Mm-hmm. Um, but Wes did have a good comeback to that. This is just a personal opinion. So this was not said. So you can't use this as like to like see which one you win. So this is not actually but evidence. No. This is this is argument. It's I like the closing arguments in a yeah. Okay. I'm not really listening to Stuart anymore. Right, no. He doesn't have to take any of my thing. It's just kind of I've personal already, thoughts. I actually already made my decision before Stuart started yeah. talking. So but I, I think n- this is not a damnation on Marilyn Monroe. It's a damnation on current today's Hollywood. But I think producers would tell her that maybe she need what she would need to be skinnier. I think that's just that's a damnation on Hollywood, not on Marilyn Monroe. I think she's as beautiful you as she is. You think they haven't told every woman that ever? Right. They told her that at the time. Even at the time? Oh, I mean, yeah. I, I don't know. Maybe at the oh, time yeah. there might have been a different standard, but you're probably she right just about got, that. She was just too big of a celebrity. That's true. For them to, yeah. at that point, but for them to. Nobody do. said that, though, so you really can't use this I'm as an argument, but that's just my I'm opinion. I'm not listening to you. So. <laughs> Your mouth is moving. I'm not hearing anything. <laughs> Good luck. But the it's, fact that it's gonna be that hard. wouldn't necessarily mean she wouldn't be popular. They tell right. lots yeah. of women are popular. They get told to be skinnier. True. Okay. 
Well, I did make my decision before Stuart. Started. I started arguing with Stuart. I'm sorry. No, that's, that's okay. like totally against the rules. I was doing. The, I did the pat. You, you're, in a, <laughs> you're in a pugilistic <laughs> mood where you're just like you're going at everyone. Okay. <laughs> so first place, I am going to give to Catherine. Second place, I'm giving to Wes. Third place, to <laughs> and I will explain. Catherine, I think you made a great point that, you know, Marilyn Monroe is popular today, even though she's dead. She has her own Facebook pl- page. I think you're right in saying she would um, exploit social media for her own benefit and that uh, Wes came at you with the fact that she may not do so well in today's uh, film industry climate, but you made a strong comeback in saying that she was a strong kind of forceful uh, push for her own, uh, what's the word, progression, I would say, even back then when it was harsher, so I think she could hold her own against the, the Hollywood climate of today. Wes, I think you made a great point in saying that Jimmy Stewart is the Tom Hanks he was the Tom Hanks of that day and that he is in 10% of AFI's uh, top 50 greatest uh, movies. Um, an iconic actor, he had a great range, and I think you made a great point in saying like how his range evolved after the war, kind of almost. Um, it, he got kind of meatier, more substantial roles, and I think, I think you made a great point with that, um, and that would do well for him today. And then Pat, I think, Henry Fonda is wonderful, and he if anyone would be a counter to Jimmy Stewart, it would be Henry Fonda. Um, but I think Wes just had the numbers on you. The herpetology case. thing. Didn't the herpa- I did appreciate <laughs> the herpetology I thing. I mean, it won me over. Yeah. yeah. I appreciate so, it. I was on the fence with it. But oh, thank <laughs> so, yes, great job, everyone. Every fight was, like, this close, you know. And, again, remember, I'm just – a guy in a bow tie. So <laughs> <laughs> I'm just a guy in a bow tie. Standing in front of a panel. Uh, exactly. Who gets ice cream with his mother. And I, you know, it, it's quality time with my mother. So you can judge if you want. But I love you, Mom. No. Gosh. Just saying. Love, okay, love so your mothers. <laughs> That's the moral of today's yeah. episode. <laughs> yeah, love your mothers. Can we save this for, like, the Mother's Day episode? You know? Sure, why not? Uh, so to reiterate, first place, uh, Catherine. Second place, okay. Wes. Third place, Pat. Thank you all for coming. It was a Good wonderful time. fight. I think I've learned the most on this fight like than I've learned over any fight. Uh, remember, if you got any questions or certain topics you want us to debate, leave us a comment or tell us on our website. And remember to hit that subscribe button. And if you like today's fight, share us on social media. I'm Rollins, and this is Final Film Fights.